Um, let me start off by saying a few words about um, <clears throat> my university. And I'm, I'm going to show about three or four slides to try and pull together some of the points of connectedness that um, Alma mentioned earlier. My university, the University of Salford, is in Manchester in the United Kingdom, which is historically the heart of the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century. It's the city to which uh, Engels came to uh, write about uh, the working class. Marx and Engels are rumored to have drunk in the pub uh, just down the road from my office. Whether that's true or not, I'm not sure. Um, and it's a, a city which, before massive deindustrialization in the mid 19th century, uh, was really the center of um, manufacturing and trade uh, in the United Kingdom. It's still the United Kingdom's uh, second city. So it's an institution, as all British universities, that are undergoing. Um, a um, process of transformation and change, both through shifting economic circumstances and also um, as we address the sort of challenges and opportunities that uh, we're talking about um, at this conference today. Um, this is a long quote which I don't intend to, uh, to read. Uh, it's from Dominique Foray's uh, The Economics of Knowledge, which is a book that I found particularly helpful in thinking um, about my own views of this. But the, the point of it is that, and it's been mentioned several times, knowledge to me has very particular qualities uh, that make it very difficult to restrict in the sorts of ways that Stuart so effectively talked about in his review of copyright legislation. And a number of people have written about this uh, in different ways, but Foray makes the point that knowledge is difficult to contain, it has spillover effects, it has amplifying benefits. It benefits most and works best when it's not constrained, uh, when it's highly codified and disseminated and not locked behind toll gates and rents that restrict its distribution. And I think that's a key philosophy for me because reacting uh, and picking up on Alma's theme of the long walk back, what I think we'll find um, with the perspective of time is that the period uh, from the Baydol Act and similar moves in the United Kingdom in 1980 through to the present is actually an aberration in the history of uh, universities and not the beginning of a new trend. Universities for me fundamentally exist to share knowledge openly and not to restrict it and constrain it. And I think the last 30 years uh, have uh, been peculiar in the restrictions that have come about through the commercialization of knowledge, the introduction of rents and tolls and other forms of restriction um, on copyright, which of course are far more extensive than just scholarly copyright alone. So I think we will see those values uh, reaffirmed to the benefit of universities as key public agencies in public life. As was said this morning, the custodians of the notion of public space that stand between government and the market in making sure that we have the beneficial distribution of knowledge that all can share. Um, this speaks to a, a work in progress which usefully uh, helps me to organize my own thoughts um, about my own university. And this is the development of what we're calling a generic open access university. In other words, we're asking ourselves the question that's been raised several times in the course of this meeting. If we were to go about uh, designing a university uh, with the benefits uh, of cyberspace, how would we go about constructing that sort of organization? And here are some of the principles. We would revert to the principles of open access, open learning, and open innovation as the key drivers of what makes a university work. At the core uh, of this concept of an open access university would be a, an open access repository, both digital and analog information. I make that point uh, 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 quite forcibly um, because although um, open access is key to digital sources, and I'm going to come uh, back to that in a minute in the next slide and talking a little about, about how we've taken this forward. We also have to remember that there are hugely important analog sources of information in the world of scholarship and knowledge that also needed to be, need to be brought into the concept of openness. And of course, I'm obviously thinking here about the world of things, the collections, the objects, the manuscripts, the archives, the things for which we need to, c to collect metadata the collections for which we still do not have interoperability for metadata that enables us to access them in the same open way. Core to this model of a generic open access university must be the notion of interpretation. 
intermediary structures that make sense of all of this information as we begin to attempt to communicate it outwards. And a final principle is that any university is um, a node um, in a massive uh, uh, collection of similar uh, organizations. There are around about 10,000 organizations in the world that credibly describe themselves as universities. They are, of course, interconnected with each other and always have been uh, through uh, the work of the academic community. And the key driver to that principle, of that principle, to build on what Stuart said uh, just now, is that other great principle of academic life. And that is, we are all trained to give away our knowledge in return for reputational returns. Our drive as academics, the drive of any academic, is to be cited as much as possible so that people who you respect will cite you back in turn. And that's why, that's what we look for when people are appointed or promoted. That's what drives the whole knowledge machine forward. So fundamentally, academic life is actually about giving away intellectual property, not retaining it. And that's what's made universities through the ages, I think, into quite distinctive uh, institutions. And underlines my point that I think with the passage of time, we'll see the last 30 years or so as an aberration rather than a new model of normality. Here's the model. I'm sorry for the uh, faintness of the diagram there, but this is a work in progress. And what we're trying to do in rethinking this is to ask this question about what would it be like if at the center of this university, this, this generic sort of university, uh, there would be an open access repository. Um, at the University of Salford, we've recently uh, set up an, an institutional repository and have in fact made uh, the um, deposit of uh, the last pre-published version of all papers and works, a requirement of academic staff. Um, there's a relatively simple way of doing that uh, in the United Kingdom's funding system, and that is to link it to the submission of the periodic research excellence framework, which is what determines the availability of funding for academics. So in other words, uh, your material will need to be in the open access repository if the university is going to return it uh, to uh, government uh, in return for the core grants uh, that enable research to be funded. Um, we have found in putting that in place that it's absolutely essential to put in place intermediary structures to assist academic staff to do that. It's worth the investment um, in the equivalent of an Office of Scholarly Communication to assist academics uh, with uh, copyright issues, with queries uh, to depositing their material. But we have found an enthusiastic response to that. And what we've been working on, uh, and are working on at the moment, is how can we extend that notion of uh, the core repository to also include other aspects uh, of data, particularly open data. Because if one connects the literature on open access with the literature on innovation. One harnesses the tremendous power of open innovation um, as a driving force. And that's, again, why I keep in the stories that I construct around this in my own institution, keep referring to our position in the heart of the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century, when openness and open innovation really drove for, forward an extraordinary period of economic success. So what you see there in the heart of the model is this notion of an open access repository. There are then key um, intermediary organizations within the university, and one way of seeing this idealized structure is to identify key staff, uh, key people who play a role in making this happen in a successful organization. Clearly, one such group of people um, are teachers, because closely linked to the central notion of an open repository is the, con is the concept um, of open learning, uh, pioneered by MIT, of course, pioneered by the Open University in the UK, um, and increasingly fitting into this notion of flexible, end, uh, edgeless universities, uh, a situation where content is no longer, it's no longer possible to contain content in a narrow sense, it's also no longer desirable. Why constantly reinvent curriculum material when so much of it is available? So teaching and the provision of resources for teaching and learning are one of those intermediary structures. Then, of course, there is the, cre the key question of books, journals, uh, and paper archives, those sorts of analog connection collections that won't necessarily be digitized or for which we will try and get um, open data standards for metadata to enable those collections uh, to be put into place. To me, again, 
This is a key part of thinking and reordering the university to take advantage of cyberspace and the opportunities that we have. As a city, Manchester, as many cities of course, is the repository of very serious uh, archive material available for scholarly research. It's the home, for example, of the entire archive of the British Labour Party, the TUC, the British Communist Party, um, and a whole history uh, of organization um, that uh, goes way back for a couple of hundred years. Now, these are essentially paper archives. The material that they're, that they're presented on is a crucial part of their condition. They're not going to be effectively digitized, at least in our lifetimes, to be made available. What's missing with all of these connections are the metadata standards that enable them to be openly accessed um, by researchers wanting to drive on scholarship. So again, bringing the notion of metadata for analog collections into this concept of the generic um, open access university is crucial. The other dimensions um, refer to the more conventionalized notions of an open repository, access to electronic journals, preprints of authors' papers and publications. One of the areas that I think we still have to tackle um, and which I, a good deal of work still needs to be done on are the appropriate protocols for open data. Uh, open data has particular demands uh, of uh, ethics, for example, of at what particular stage data should be deposited and the control of that data. Now again, my university has, on several counts, uh, the largest health science faculty in the United Kingdom uh, and we play a very important role I'm in the area of local public health. That means that the university is building up a very substantial record of epidemiological data, quite important to understand uh, health and well-being in a modern urban environment. Imagining restructuring that information um, as open data demands still more work on ethical principles and protocols to enable the full authority and opportunity uh, of that information for further research, further research uh, to be realized. And then on the um, outer rim of my diagram here is a concept of the sort of communities that we serve as a public institution occupying a public space. Now for me a university is a public institution whether or not all of its fees uh, pay, whether or not all of its students pay fees or whether or not it has a dependency um, on government for funding. A university is a public university by public charter. A museum, for example, doesn't become a private institution simply because it charges everybody who comes through its doors an admissions fee. It is still a public institution. And the, 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 the Royal Chartered Universities, of which we are one, many in the UK, over 140, um, are key public institutions that occupy that space um, between the public sector and government. And what I've put up here is a notion of some of those sectors that the public university serves. Obviously, a general public sector, obviously it's students, a private sector, and increasingly the so-called third sector of NGO, civic organizations, many of which are organizing themselves around the new opportunities of cyberspace for different sorts of forms of civic organization. If you take the university out as an institution, if you were to take out those 10,000 institutions across the world that describe themselves as universities, you would have a massive institutional gap in terms of our concepts of how the world of information can be put together and how the world of access can be put together. So, and this is my last slide, this model for the edgeless university, I think it's useful to put up uh, generic concepts of what we would do if we were designing a new university. It Be becomes a benchmark, a standard for rethinking organizations, uh, the organization of our universities in the face of new opportunities and new constraints. This concept of an edgeless university looks to the realities of the present. Uh, what we have got from cyberspace um, over the past 20 or so years, this unbounded notion of knowledge, unconstrained uh, by volume, unconstrained by time, unconstrained by space, the realization of open innovation, uh, the flowering of knowledge that can take off if those constraints are removed, and the huge possibilities of collaborative learning uh, that enabled us, um, to, um, enable us to work in different ways. I think um, in retrospect, I regard myself uh, as a digital native, possibly unexpectedly, but for the main reason that I can still remember the excitement 
of putting my archaeological data on punch cards in 1973. Um, and the notion that we were doing something still different. I can still remember an Apple II where you could underline something by putting a six-figure code before and afterwards, and I still remember Bill Gates saying 64K should be enough for anyone. Um, and I think that we have seen these successive revolutions um, in technology that are enabling us to do things in really exciting ways. But critically, the model of the edgeless university also records, recalls those pre-digital benefits of a commonwealth of learning. The notion uh, that libraries were open, were shared, the only constraint was distance and time, the opportunity uh, to link things together, which I, I think, as Alma has very powerfully said, we have lost in the period symbolically marked, I think, by Bay Dole in 1980, a 30-year aberration that's taken us away from those principles of learning and scholarship, which were fundamentally what the university was about. And finally, to reiterate the point that I've made already, I think all universities are, are, are driven uh, by a founding force of academic life. And that is we all work very, very hard to give away knowledge in return for reputational benefits. And thank you. I'll leave it at that. We did start a bit late, and we have used our time, but we can take a couple of questions. Um, if you would like to ask one, could you say to whom you would like to address your question, or to everybody, if that is the case? Does anybody, are uh, questions or even comments? No, everybody wants their tea and coffee. We flattened them. No questions? Yeah. We nearly got to our tea. <laughs> okay. Hello, my name is Noella Edelman from the Center for E-Government at the Danube University, Krems, Austria. I've read a lot about the Manchester Manifesto, um, so maybe I'd like to address this question to you, Alma and Martin. How has the Manchester Manifesto impacted what your work is about and, and, and the open access movement and um, what has been the, the, the response to it. Could you outline the Manchester Manifesto for those who haven't heard about the Manchester Manifesto? I was hoping you would be able to tell me more about that. <laughs> no, <I'm not> <laughs> Martin, do you want to? <laughs> oh. The answer is it's made no impression at all um, because it hasn't in practice affected the, um, the policies that individual universities have followed in developing their future. And that speaks to one of the most severe difficulties that I think we have with, with taking the way forward and that is the way universities are pitched in a competitive environment with one another uh, rather than working in a collaborative frame. So I think a lot of the problems I mean, and, and again, to situate it within the context of attempting to develop public policy in a city like Manchester, Manchester comprises 10 local authorities which are fairly constantly at war with each other, five universities which tend not to speak with each other because the funding systems force us into competition. And this generates a very significant number of manifestos and a very significant number of policy statements, uh, but relatively little relationship between that and subsequent action. Yes, I, I, I think that the, the, the model that we have at the moment in the United Kingdom in university funding is fundamentally wrong um, because government funds are used to encourage competitiveness between institutions, which goes back to the British equivalent of the Bay Dole philosophy, primarily to Margaret Thatcher's government and the, constant, the, the concept of third stream income. We have very little incentive for deep collaboration. We have a lot of incentive for shallow policy making.
Hi, I'm Alec Tarkovsky from Creative Commons Poland. I have a question for Stuart. Um, you described the model where you shift the um, sort of the effort of the lazy scientists to that single moment where they vote on an open access mandate. So how do you achieve a situation where, as far as I understand, they voted um, anonymously for it, right? Yes. Was, it, was that in, in case of Harvard easy or, or was there a long process to convince those scientists? Or were they lazy even in that decision and just followed the pack? Or you? Or oh. oh, somebody turned it on. So, no, no, it's on. It's on. Uh, so, uh, I can assure you that nothing in the case of Harvard is easy. Um, we worked on the uh, process for about two years before the vote uh, and uh, but over time it's gotten easier so it was about a two-year process before preparing for the FAS vote R roughly similar for the law school uh, now we're down to maybe a year or so it, there's a lot of variation part of it is because things move very slowly uh, you have to schedule, there's a lot of time spent uh, uh, meeting with all kinds of constituencies within the organization just to make sure everyone understands what the policy is. The, when you first uh, say to faculty, um, here's what we're going to do, we're going to have this vote and you're going to grant rights to the university for your articles. There's an initial um, uh, um, kind of shock to the faculty member system. This can't possibly be a good thing. Uh, so you have to, you, it takes a while to get everybody to understand what's really going on and that you're still retaining the choice of whether or not this license will occur and so forth. It takes a long time. You have to talk to a lot of people. And, uh, but now that we've done it over and over again, uh, there starts to be a process where when you talk to the nth school and you can say, look, n minus one schools have already done this and it's you know, it's not, things haven't fallen apart. It becomes a little bit, a little bit easier. Ah, okay. So I, there, was, there were questions, I guess, about publisher publisher reaction to the policy. Uh, um, the, uh, there's been a very broad range of reactions. So there, there are, uh, uh, for, for, uh, we'll go from the most negative to the most positive. So from the most negative, there's a small set of publishers who uh, are um, uh, uh, basically um, don't like the idea that the university would have this non-exclusive license. They're not willing to publish articles for which there is this non-exclusive license. And they're systematic about requiring that every article they publish from a Harvard faculty member who falls under one of these policies, and that's not all Harvard faculty because there's some schools that don't have the policy yet, smaller and smaller number of them. Uh, but if they do fall under the policy, they re require that the faculty member grant a waiver. Typically what happens is a paper is accepted for publication uh, through the normal process. Then the publisher will s send a note to the faculty member saying, we need to see the waiver. Faculty member will, the, the way you get a waiver is you fill out a little form on the web with a few lines to the title of the article and so forth and you click submit. And then within a day you get uh, the, an email and physical copy of a waiver document and then that's forwarded on to the publisher and then they publish the article. So there's a very small number of uh, uh, publishers that have that reaction. Uh, at the most positive side, we have publishers who are quite uh, sympathetic with the idea and have agreed that uh, uh, their um, policy will be that they're fine with it, that they don't require waivers, they don't even require any uh, amendment to their publication agreement. And we have a list of those publishers on our website, publishers easiest to publish with. Uh, and um, and then in between, there's a, the vast majority of publishers who seem to be uh, acting with benign neglect, kind of like faculty members do. Maybe they're lazy too. And 
mostly we don't hear from them. Every once in a while, they'll ask an author to get a waiver, but not systematically. Uh, but the, the, uh, in the end, the number of waivers is uh, as um, one might expect looking at the uh, whole um, uh, literature on opt-in versus opt-out policies in all kinds of areas, from organ donation to retirement planning, uh, the number of waivers is very small. Although the, the worry before the first of these policies was enacted was that the number of waivers would be huge, would be a, a large fraction of the total number of articles that the faculty published would be subject to these waivers. It's turning out that it seems to be around 5% of the articles for which waivers are granted. So that means for 95% of the articles, we're retaining this extremely broad right of exercising all of copyright so long as the articles aren't sold. Um, of the waivers, uh, the um, bulk of them are from this very small number, a handful of publishers uh, who are systematic about their uh, um, uh, not, not wanting to uh, play along with this policy. I can't remember if that answers all the questions on that slide, but that's the basic structure. Thank you again to Alma Swano and all the other panelists. Thank you. And uh, please, uh, we will start again sharp at 4.25. Thank you.